Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar from Risk-Based Security. It is great to have you here and I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and well. My name is Brendan Dodds, I'm a director here at Risk-Based Security and I'm going to be your host for today. And over the next 30 to 45 minutes we're going to be digging into the latest statistics on the data breach landscape based on updated data from the first half of 2020. We'll be sharing who was breached, what was exposed, and looking at the trends we're seeing in the data. And I don't want to uh, steal your thunder, Inga, but it's been a really weird period. <laughs> There's been a lot to talk about. <laughs> a very unusual six-month period. Well, <laughs> before we get into all of that, just a couple of quick points of housekeeping to share so that we can all get the most out of today's session. Uh, the recording of today's session is going to be made available. It will be on Bright Talk and it will be on our website. So bookmark this link. And while you're there, why don't you, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues who might find this interesting and useful. This is part of an ongoing series of webinars focused on the latest trends and issues in data breaches, vulnerabilities, and more in the security space. And we don't want you to miss out. So this will be a great time to subscribe to the Risk-Based Security channel on Bright Talk. And we love to hear from you. We want your questions, so please post them in the box provided. We will address some of them as we go, and we'll also make sure to pause for Q&A at the end of the session as well. And just to let you know, when you post questions on Bright Talk, they are anonymous. So we don't know who's asked them. If you want us to acknowledge you by name, please mention your name, role, company, whatever information you want to share with us in the question itself. And if you are watching the replay, or if you need to get in touch with us for any other reason, you can do so via the contact page on our website, which is riskbasedsecurity.com. Well, the analysis you're going to hear today is based on our 2020 Mid-Year Data Breach Quick View Report. And that report was released today, so for most of you, this will be your first opportunity to see this data. Um, it is available to you to download at no cost. In fact, if you're registered for this webinar, you can download it right here from Bright Talk over in the content section. Now, if you're watching the replay or you can't see it for any reason, you can find that report and further analysis on emerging data breach trends on our website. Again, that is riskbasedsecurity.com or via the product cyberriskanalytics.com. Well, I am Brenda Dodds, as I said, but it is now time to introduce you to our presenter for today's session, Inga Godin, Executive Vice President here at Risk Space Security. Inga found her way to information security after 20 years in the insurance industry, where she, get, she got to see firsthand the impact of ineffective security program management and the financial fallouts from data breach events. And here at Risk Space Security, she's responsible for our cyber risk analytics and your CISO products. And it is my pleasure to hand you today over to Inga, who's going to take us through the agenda. All right. Thank you so much, Brendan, for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for tuning in for this session. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, as Brendan said, my name is Inga Godin, and we will be talking about all of that wackiness <laughs> of the first six months of this year um, with regard to breach activity. Uh, just one quick note to keep in mind as we go through um, and compare numbers to prior years. We are comparing to the same time period for those prior years, so we'll be doing uh, six months to six months. Um, just to highlight all that craziness. Um, because it has been such an unusual period of ups and downs, I did want to do something a little bit different for our time together today. Um, I'd like to start out by actually highlighting a couple of the key findings from our Data Breach Quick View report and ask the question and hopefully answer the question, is this a new normal for us? Then from there, um, we're going to do what we always do. Um, we are going to dig into the first six months of 2020 by the numbers. So we will be looking at what was exposed, um, the type of breaches that were taking place, who was experiencing these types of events, and where these breaches were occurring. Uh, by all means, questions are very much welcome, so please let us know if uh, you do have any uh, questions that come to mind as we go through the session. I'm looking forward to being able to answer those for you. So with that, um, let's talk about a couple of the key findings from our report. And right off the bat, there are two things that really stand out, um, certainly stood out quite starkly <laughs> to myself, and I think will stand out to everybody who uh, has a chance to take a look at that report. 
Um, and the first key finding is that breach disclosures are actually down 52% compared to the same time period for 2019. But at the same time that we're looking at that decline, the number of records exposed are nearly six times higher <laughs> than they were in 2019. Um, which absolutely begs the question, you know, what is going on here? What is happening? Um, are we really seeing that many, that, that many less or that less number of breaches taking place? And for those breaches that are happening, are they really getting that much worse? Um, it certainly has been a question uh, that's been top of mind to us uh, at the research team. And I'm going to go on the record right at the outset as saying, um, no, I actually don't think that breach activity has declined nearly as starkly as a 52% decline might indicate. And likewise, I don't think that we're nearly, um, we're not seeing severity uh, per breach in terms of number of records exposed uh, jump quite as high as six times um, as that six times figure might indicate. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why, and, and I wanted to highlight those as we, as we get started here. Um, it, for folks that have uh, been following our breach research, uh, you know that the first part of 2019, there were some uh, large collections of data leaks that came out, and our research team picked those up and aggregated those, which really did influence the number of breach reports that were coming out for the first six months of last year. Now, that's not actually uh, all that unusual. We have always had uh, spikes in time where uh, large collections or data sets come out um, into, into the public realm all at once. Um, typically, we do see those sort of smooth out as time goes on. Um, so far, we haven't seen that smoothing effect take place this year. Uh, but there's another reason um, that I think, or another, um, yeah, another reason that's impacting uh, some of these results. And you know, I know COVID-19 is getting blamed for a lot of stuff, but I do actually think all of the news and all of the attention being um, rightfully so uh, devoted to what's happening in the world today, and not just COVID, but all the other news that's been taking place over the first six months of this year, it does seem to be affecting really our own personal supply chain of information about data breaches. And I'll talk about why I think that is in a little bit more detail. Um, I certainly don't think it's quite as bad as trying to find toilet paper back in March, um, but we are certainly uh, seeing some impacts um, and some, uh, some real obvious um, uh, movement in the amount of information that's coming out about breach activity. Um, so that, I think, is an important thing to share with everybody who's tuning in. Now, with regard to that number of records exposed is nearly six times higher than it was for the same time period last year. Um, what I think is very important to keep in mind about that particular statistic is we are still seeing a lot of open, unsecured data sets um, being exposed and that information coming to light. And in fact, that six times jump is due largely to just three specific breaches that were exceptionally sizable. And in fact, just those three breaches alone contributed to 84% of the records exposed to the first six months of this year. So is it as bad as, as all that? Yeah, probably not. Um, since we do have those three large breaches in there, but it does make for some interesting graphs, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so let's dig into those numbers specifically. And I have to say, every time I look at these two graphs, I have a little bit of a shudder um, because it, they just look so unusual to me. Um, what we're seeing on the screen on the left-hand side is the number of publicly disclosed breaches for the six-month periods throughout that time. And what we're seeing on the right-hand side is the number of records exposed. And as you can see, you know, 2019 is a bit of an anomaly, um, coming in at 4,298 uh, 4, uh, publicly disclosed breaches for the same time last year. This year, we're standing at 2,037. Now, I personally was a bit surprised to see that number 2,037. Um, coming in that much lower. I actually thought it was going to be somewhere between 2018 and 2019. 
Um, certainly we have the effect of those large collections and having a new collection come out so far this year. That's certainly impacting our 2020 numbers. But like I said, we are seeing a bit of a slowdown in the, um, in the flow of information. And just even comparing uh, 2020 to 2018, we see that the number of reported breaches is down about 19% which actually is a really tantalizing change to me because at the same time, we saw about a 16% decline in the number of resources or, or information um, sources that come out to um, describe and, and provide more data about the breach activity that's happening. Now, I know I shouldn't read too much into some of these uh, percentages or some of these statistics, but it was really interesting that we saw a same amount of decline um, and roughly the same amount of decline in the number of reports as we did with the number of breaches compared to a more stable year, that 2018 year. And just to shed a little bit more light on that, um, the way our resources work for us, um, for all of the publicly disclosed breaches that we publish information about, um, we always look for a source that we can point and say, this is where our information came from. And typically in 2019, 2018, and what have you, we would see anywhere from you know, maybe uh, six to 10 to a dozen uh, public resources that we could point to as supporting documentation or supporting information about that breach activity. Um, when we compare the number of resources that are coming to light today, we saw a real drop off. We're seeing something like three, six, maybe seven resources come to light per breach. Um, which to us indicates, or at least to me indicates, some of those breaches that might have only had maybe one or two public reports that we could point to, the information on those incidents just isn't quite breaking through the surface at this time. So some uh, interesting information, um, I think, on the, the number of publicly disclosed breaches. And Inga, if I could now, just jump in with a, a quick question here that's related yeah. to something you were just talking about. Quick question, does risk-based security blend media reporting of data breaches with state-based reporting in your data collection process? Are both categories, this might, I, the first piece is an easy question, the second piece I'm not sure, <laughs> are both categories seeing this decrease? Ah, uh, that's, that's a wonderful couple of questions. And the answer is yes and yes, actually. <laughs> Or I should say yes and sorta. <laughs> um, so yes, we do use a blend of media reporting um, along with um, some of the very familiar state-based sources, like some of the um, state uh, attorneys general uh, resources that are made available. We gather up all that and more to use as a part of our collection process. So yes, absolutely. And it is actually both sources that we've seen either a decline or a slowdown. Uh, you know, and some of the media sources, like I said, you know, some of the smaller stories I think just aren't getting the, the bandwidth that they might have had in the past. Um, but for those state AG sources as well, um, you know, our states are under a lot of pressure right now. Um, they're dealing with a lot of problems, and we see just a certain slowness with that information being published and, and pushed out for sure. Um, you know, some states are, are doing a little bit better than others, but um, there were a couple of states that I was uh, monitoring not too long ago that are roughly 60 days behind where they were the same time last year. Um, other states where they're just not, yeah, it, it's just, I think they're just under so much pressure with everything that's going on right now that pushing that information out is, it's going to the bottom of the list <laughs> on somebody's <laughs> daily activities. So we're seeing a slowdown there, although I think more of that information will come out as time goes on. So excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Anonymous Questioner, and thank you, Inga. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so looking over to the right there with the number of records exposed, and we see a whopping 27.6 billion with a B records exposed in the first six months of this year. Um, which is actually the most records exposed that we have ever seen for any time period that we've looked at. Again, these are driven by three very large, sizable, open, unsecured databases uh, that came to light uh, in the first six months of this year. And it is unusual to see the, the size of the ones that we saw. It was unusual both in, in terms of the number of records exposed and then to have three of them all at once. 
uh, was a little bit out of left field. Um, but that said, misconfigured databases and misconfigured services are far from being a new problem. In fact, um, they've been of interest to black hats and white hats alike as um, the ability to search for these things has become a bit easier uh, you know, through mechanisms like Shodan where you can look for internet connected uh, services and, and devices and that sort of thing. Um, so we are seeing uh, those sizable data leaks continue to contribute to the overall number of records lost. But we'll talk, uh, we'll dig into those numbers in a little more detail in just a minute. Uh, but from there, for the sake of time, let's move on and look at how are all of these events happening. So we, uh, for all of our uh, data breach events, we look at a primary breach type. So you know, what is that um, proximate cause or what caused the data loss event? And we have coming in at the top spot, not a big surprise, um, hacking or unauthorized access into services or systems certainly once again takes the top um, <laughs> the top category is the most popular breach type um, with 1,334 of the events so far uh, this year being attributed to that that type of um, unauthorized access activity uh, followed a close second and third by malware which gets coded as virus in, in the graph and uh, web exposure which is those um, those open uh, unsecured databases or anytime information is made available online. Um, and I do think that actually that brings up kind of an interesting question or a coding question for us. Um, and that is, you know, why would we choose something like hack over virus when so often incidents involve an element of both, right? You know, malicious actors get into the system. They launch some sort of malware in there, some sort of virus in there that contributes to the, the overall event. So what goes into one bucket and what goes into the other? And again, um, we, we borrow from our friends in the legal world and we look at that closest proximate cause of the data loss to be our primary breach type here. Or you know, if we think about that, in other words, it's, it's the action that ultimately resulted in the data compromise. So when you have, you know, attackers getting into the system, you know, they root around, explore, see what they can find of interest. Maybe they divert some emails or they, they download the data, whether they do it manually or they actually use um, some sort of malware to download the data. That to us gets coded as hacking. And we can contrast that with virus or malware as being the type of situation where it's not exactly clear that attackers had that access and were able to leverage it in order to steal the data. Whether, rather, it's the malware itself that was implanted perhaps automatically and automatically um, had a component to it that automatically was responsible for, for compromising the information. And it has been a really interesting evolution to watch this, especially with regards to the new type, well, not new types, but the, <laughs> the more audacious uh, ransomware events that we're seeing these days, especially out of groups like, you know, Maze Group or the Doppelpamer and that film, what have you, um, where the groups that use that type of malware generally um, get into the system, stay in the system for a little while, exfiltrate data, and then launch the ransomware attack. And those types of attacks for us are coded as hacking as opposed to um, malware, where ransomware would be a secondary uh, indicator on that breach. We do have another question here from someone watching, which is, uh, how do you code a phishing attack on this? I think that's probably quite similar to what you've just said. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a great question. So um, for us, again, it gets to that closest proximate cause and phishing can be used as either a means to an end or directly to the end itself. So for those attacks that actually begin with a phishing attack um, and they use that in order to be able to um, maybe trick a user into giving up their credentials or launching the malware that's going to get the credentials, that's going to get them into the system, what have you, um, that is generally a supplementary breach type in this, in this system or in our coding system. 
Um, so that would not be a primary breach type. When it would be a primary breach type is when we saw things like phishing for W-2 forms <laughs> where somebody poses perhaps as, um, you know, somebody outside the organization poses as, um, as maybe the CEO and, by, and doesn't necessarily have access into the, the email system and says, hey, email me all of your W-2 forms for last year. And the, um, the target actually responds by emailing the data. So it was a direct response to the phishing attack that exposed the data. And that's when that would be coded as phishing as a primary breach type. So fantastic question. Fantastic question. Um, Real quickly before we move on to our next uh, to our next uh, slide, um, it is worth taking a, a quick look at that <laughs> whopping 27 billion plus records exposed. So moving over to the right side of the screen, um, we do see that web that online exposure um, is responsible for 26 billion records exposed out of the 27 billion. And again, just three incidents really being the significant driver behind that. Um, although malicious action, uh, uh, unauthorized access is, it, it seems like it's so far behind, but was still responsible for 1.1 billion records exposed so far in the first six months of this year. And that actually, even though it looks small on the graph, is not something to sneeze at. So oh, um, moving along, um, one of the other things that we always like to look at is um, the attack vector or the party that was responsible for the breach. What was their relationship to the breached organization or the victim organization? And not surprising um, with uh, hacking being our top breach type, um, it's not surprising to see outsiders or malicious outsiders being our top um, attack vector. When we do look at insider activity, um, we see that uh, the majority of that is actually accidents or errors um, that happen on the part of the insider. So, you know, simply an employee doing their job and they make a mistake. Um, and these mistakes can really run the gamut. They can be from, you know, sending sensitive data to the wrong party, um, all the way through those giant uh, database problems where you know, administrators accidentally leave a data set or a service open and accessible to anybody that happens to come along and find it. I mean, I know a lot has been made of the malicious insider, um, and they certainly can do their damage, um, but on a pure percentage of events, um, malicious insiders tend to be um, not the primary uh, contributor <laughs> into overall breach count. Going on from there, um, another way to look at breach activity, and this is one of my favorite ways to look at breach activity, actually, um, is to look through the lens of whether or not we have conclusive evidence or, or confirmation that the data that was put um, at risk or the data that was exposed has actually been um, landed in the hands of unauthorized actors to do unauthorized things with. And what we do see, um, this. Uh, for this period, I think it's actually a little bit of good news. And um, we do see that confirmed events were confirmed that the data is in the hands and has been accessed and used uh, inappropriately. Um, we see that in 1,355 of the breaches, or about 66% of the breaches for the first six months of this year. About 31%, or about, uh, well, actually, uh, 633 events, um, the impact was potential, meaning the data is at risk, it's out there, um, anyone who wants to access it certainly could access it, but it's not confirmed that the data has actually been exploited. And now the reason why I think this is a little bit of good news or a bit of a bright spot is we've been tracking these percentages of confirmed versus potential for several years now. Um, and for this same time period in 2018, so going back a couple of years, for the same time period in 2018, the split was 74% confirmed to 24% potential. And now in 2019, the split was approximately 84% confirmed and 16% potential. So we had been on a track where the confirmed was growing, 
And we've actually turned a little bit of a corner um, for the first six months of this year where it's come down to that 66% level. So I take my bright spots where I can find them, and I'm going to take that as good news. Um, moving on from there, um, it's, I think, a good idea to take a look at the types of data that are being lost or compromised or exposed across all of these different events. Um, and regular readers of our report and our research know that it is not at all surprising to see access credentials in the form of email addresses and passwords. Um, that combination of those two data points right there at number one and number two on the list as being the most compromised data types. Um, that has been the trend in recent years. Um, certainly understandable why. You know, if you can get those access credentials, why not? You've got the keys to the front door. Why try to break in? Um, so continues to be prized data to have. And I, I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon this year. Um, but all that said, you know, if we go over to the chart on the right, um, you can see that the percentage of breaches exposing email addresses and passwords is actually down uh, quite a bit compared to 2019 and slightly below um, 2018. Now, I think the difference uh, with 2019 is due largely to those uh, credential leaks, those uh, data leaks, that, those clusters, those collections of leaks that we saw early in 2019. I think that has an influence in what we see in the numbers over there. Um, as, you know, what was, uh, well, like I said, what was influencing the 2019 numbers? Um, but what is a little bit different this year is we do see name as a data type actually start to creep up um, to levels that we haven't seen um, quite as frequently as we have in the past. And I think this might actually be a, a bit of the, the impact of uh, some of that slowdown in reporting, what I think is actually starting to make a little more, um, make itself a little more prominent is those statutory obligations to disclose data breach events. And even though that reporting has been a little bit slow, um, it still is coming out. And generally, that statutory obligation to um, notify an individual happens when there's a name in conjunction with another uh, data point that triggers that obligation. Uh, so because those obligations are, they're not going away. COVID-19 is not a race in those. Um, news about those events um, still is bubbling to the surface, I think, um, um, uh, in order to comply with those legal requirements. So um, interesting trend that we'll continue to watch uh, throughout the year. Uh, another one of my personal favorites to look at is the number of incidents um, with records lost according to different bands. And I think this is an interesting one because I think it speaks directly to the concept of severity and how many records are actually being lost per breach. You know, it's great to look at um, an average records, but again, you get those weird outliers have that, that math effect in there <laughs> driving the average up. Um, and certainly, um, if you're like me, you know, I also have a tendency to think that uh, you know, when I see news about a really large breach, you assume that that's the norm for all breaches, um, which isn't necessarily the case when we actually break it down. And when we do look at breach activity um, spread out by the different layers of records exposed, you know, we do still see that the majority of breaches are those with a confirmed record count that is. So, you know, if we take out those 391 that are unknown, um, when we look at where the, you know, the distribution of breach events where the record count is confirmed, you know, we're still seeing that most breaches expose 10,000 or less records. And in fact, um, that represents about 74% of the reported breaches with confirmed counts. So a little bit, I think, of a, a little more of a bright spot um, that we see uh, here. And I'm, again, sticking to my bright spots where I can find them. <laughs> but oh, that said, um, we are actually starting to see severity inch a bit higher when we look at it through the lens of um, our severity score. So um, we've had a metric out there for some time now to score all of the breach events that we publish information about. Um, it's our way of just measuring how bad is a, a breach uh, based on the fairly standardized formula. And here we actually split out 
Q1 of this year compared to Q2 of this year. And in the first three months of the year, we saw an average severity score come in at 4.7, um, whereas in Q2, we saw the average severity score come in at 5.4. So even though there are some weird outliers out there that you know, we'll move averages up and down and, and push, you know, number of records exposed to the astronomical heights. Um, there are still indications that severity is ticking up a little bit. I, I actually have a question for this one, Inga, if you'll uh, bear yeah. with me for a moment. I'll, I'm interested in, I mean, are we basing this on CVSS or it, what's, the, what's the model for oh. these severity scores here? Yes, yeah, so, well, not CVSS, but our own, <laughs> our own special proprietary scoring system, actually. Um, but that is a great question. Um, it is a logarithmic scale, so it's like the it's like an earthquake or a Richter scale, um, where we look at um, the number of records lost, or we can extrapolate a, a certain number of records lost, and then we um, add into that formula or make a part of that formula um, various data points that get scored, like um, how did the breach occur? Um, were there impacted third parties, like their customers' data was impacted? Um, was there a follow-on lawsuit? What types of data were, were compromised? Was it something that's changeable, like a, um, well, like a username and password? Or is it a fixed data point, like somebody's date of birth <laughs> that can't be changed? Um, so we assign values to all these different data points and pull that into our formula as well. So breach scoring can actually change. Uh, any individual breach score can actually change over time, depending on some follow-on events that might happen, or you know, if more information comes out. So it's just been a nice, it's been a nice way to measure, um, you know, what's going on out there. So yeah, very cool. Great Thank question. You. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, moving on from there, um, let's take a closer look at who is actually experiencing all this breach activity. And now for uh, this particular chart, um, we actually slice and dice organizations um, in a number of different ways. But for this particular chart, we're following the NAICS classification system, which breaks down businesses into various uh, economic sectors. And we're looking at breach activity as it is spread out across those economic sectors within that NAICS classification system. And as we can see, the information sector just barely edged out healthcare services uh, this year, or excuse me, for this time period. Um, but they're really tied pretty much for the top spot. Um, but one of the things that I do find interesting about these two different uh, groupings, when you put these two different economic sectors side by side, we see really different, uh, a different picture for the various subgroups that actually drive the breaches going into these sectors. For example, in the information sector, we see the vast majority of this activity being driven by just three individual groups in there, the software publishers, the hosting services, and, and the websites, that's really what's driving um, all of that breach experience for the most part. It's not the telecoms, it's not the ISPs, you know, it's not the other traditional media companies that make up that sector. It's really just the tech heavy pieces that make up that sector. But when we flip that around and we look at healthcare, we actually see that breaches are pretty evenly spread out throughout the healthcare industry, whether it be a physician practice group, um, a, um, a hospital, other type of allied healthcare provider, what have you, they're pretty much all experiencing breaches at the same rate. So moving on from there, uh, we of course like to look at where breaches are happening um, by location as well. Um, and spoiler alert, we have a, a, new, <laughs> a new metric to share with everybody in the next slide. So stay tuned for just a little bit longer. But before we get there, um, let's look a little bit closer at breaches by location. Uh, so where are all these uh, breaches taking place? And the answer is pretty much everywhere. Um, for the first six months of this year, we observed about 50% of the disclosed events um, coming to light within the U.S with the balance being either unknown, meaning the breach lo location really couldn't be determined um, based on the information that we had available, 
or occurring outside of the U.S. Now, I do think it's interesting over the past a couple of years or comparing this uh, particular metric to the past couple of years, we have seen non-U.S. actually creep up in our data set. Um, but I do want to share with everybody, just in the interest of full disclosure, uh, that we do conduct the majority of our research in English, which I think does influence some of these things, or some of this, uh, this particular data to, to a certain extent. Um, and I think because we have really ramped up what we're looking for, since we know that uh, resource reporting is a little bit low, <laughs> we're looking under every single rock that we can find, you know, I think we are picking up a little bit more outside of the U.S. is a bit more of a driver of our research process right now. So just want to you know, be fair about that and be upfront about that. Um, so now on to our surprise, uh, <laughs> our surprise, or our new, I should say, our new, our new analysis uh, for this particular report is actually looking at breach type by country. Um, and so what we did, uh, the gentleman that I work with, uh, we worked together to crunch all these numbers and put all these uh, charts and graphs together. Um, we were talking about, well, what new can we look at? And I said, well, let's look at, you know, let's look at breach type by location and see if there's anything there, there. And his response was, well, okay, yeah, why not? Let's go for it. <laughs> um, and we thought, well, there'd be something interesting or want there. And honestly, I thought the distribution was going to look kind of the same in every country that we looked at, but that was not the case. And um, we took the, the top 10 countries represented in the data set for the first six months of the year, and we, uh, again, uh, graphed out um, what were the, the breach types associated with the events uh, taking place in those particular countries. And we can see for the top five countries, um, U.S., Great Britain, Canada, India, and Australia, we really see that diversity of breach type taking place. Now, obviously, hacking is, is way up there because it's our number one breach type, and along with um, accidental exposure online through web, uh, we saw our fair share of viruses, but we really saw all of the breach types being represented um, across these locations. But then when we looked at our second uh, tier, the, the, second, the next five in the top 10, Brazil, Russia, Denmark, France, and Italy, um, we really just saw hacking, web, and virus being, or malware, being the um, breach types represented in those data samples. Now, I have to admit, I'm a little bit at a loss <laughs> to be perfectly blunt to um, say why. It is something that we are going to continue to dig into and look at um, as we go forward, because I think this is a really um, a tantalizing first outcome that we have to look at. Um, you know, I have some theories, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, because of how we conduct our research, maybe that might be a part of the influence. Um, you know, I'm often thinking that culturally um, what actually gets reported uh, may influence the outcome as well. You know, certain things where, um, you know, there's like a particular user error or um, uh, perhaps something that was a, just a mistake. You know, maybe that just doesn't rise to the level of interest, or maybe culturally it's just not something that um, that would be highlighted or, or, or promoted out as a as a as a breach. So, we're going to continue to dig into that a little bit more as the year goes on, and get you some more answers there. So, as we uh, come towards the end of our time today, um, just to highlight some of our our. Um, what I see as being some of our key findings or some of the most important takeaways from today's session. Um, breach disclosures, they certainly are down, uh, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> compared to uh, 2019, but even compared to prior years as well. Um, is it a temporary disruption or is it the new norm? I'm coming down on the side of temporary disruption. I'm sure there's going to be some more data collections that are going to, or data leak collections that are going to come out. They always do. And I'm sure at some point reporting is going to return um, a little more to the normal pace. Um, number of records exposed is up, even though it's largely attributable to those open data sets. Um, I do think that that's a trend that's here to stay. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, so that one I think is going to be stuck with us for a little while. 
severity is starting to edge up higher, even though it's the outliers that are driving the number of records exposed. Severity is looking like it's going the wrong direction right now. Another data point we'll continue to talk about uh, as we go forward. And just a reminder that our healthcare providers, they really are on the front lines in so many ways, um, not just with responding to the healthcare crisis that we have going on, but also being battered left and right uh, from, from our attackers. So um, props to our, our healthcare providers for fighting the fight on multiple fronts. So with that, I think we've had a few questions come in. Oh my goodness, Inga, they are flooding in thick and fast. <laughs> so just let's get straight to it. On, on, that last, um, on that last slide a moment ago, quick question, is the percentage of breaches by country a representation of data by company headquarters or by citizen records? Ah, we look at where the country is located and as specifically as we can where um, where the breach occurred for that okay. particular company. It's where the breach occurred for the company. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All yeah. right, that was a quick and easy one. Excellent. A um, couple more then. I, yeah. um, I did see this, I think it's a very interesting question, very to the point question. Um, have those three large open databases that we talked about a couple of times, have they been solved slash rectified? Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity in exactly what we mean by solved with regard to a data breach, <laughs> but I assume what they mean is, are they no longer open databases? <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. Well, that's my assumption too. And yes, yeah. um, my understanding is those three have been resolved. Um, you know, a part of the... Uh, reporting process for a lot of research firms, ourselves included, is we don't disclose that type of information until it has been resolved and, and taken down. So mm. um, certainly some of them will hang out there, um, especially if it's extremely difficult to track down who they belong to um, or if the organization that does own them is completely non-responsive. And sometimes I feel like I'm the plague knocking on the door when we <laughs> try to inform an organization that you've got a security issue here. Boy, it's like I have never felt so unwelcome in my life. <laughs> but, um, you know, if there is any one takeaway from all of this, um, I will say, you know, organizations, if you can please, please, please um, provide researchers a mechanism, whatever mechanism works for you, be able to report security issues to you in a way that we can make sure that these things like these open data sets get resolved. Yeah. Um, it's very important. Um, it could be as simple as a, an inbox, right? An email address, something we can use. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, security yeah. at. <laughs> security at, there you go, everyone. There's the takeaway <laughs> today. There's, There's the, the takeaway, yeah. I, I have a really quick and easy one. This actually came up in the last webinar, but I think it will be a perennial favorite because it's a really good question. So it's good to clarify. We uh, we saw mm -hmm. unknown come up on some of those graphs. In fact, I think I saw one which broke out unknown separately from miscellaneous. So why is that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the reason why we use unknown is because we don't like to guess, <laughs> basically, is the reason. Um, we have um, core data points that we aggregate for every breach event that is represented in our database. Um, and a lot of those core data points are included in our reports and, and in this session today as well. And for those, when we um, don't have uh, definitive information, if there's conflicting information, or if we're just simply not comfortable with um, the quality of the information that's coming out, uh, we'll defer to an unknown or an undisclosed uh, status instead of uh, going with something that we think might be a little more questionable or, or potentially inaccurate. And that's why we see the unknown appearing in our charts. Got it. Yep. Makes sense. Um, final question on the last minute. It's a big one. <laughs> when, when do you think breach reporting will get back to normal? <laughs> I don't Good luck. know. <laughs> Actually, no. Um, you know, I do think that um, we are starting to see a few signs of things 
uh, getting uh, more back to normal uh, personally, and I've seen a few more skimming incidents <laughs> come to light. That's one of my, you know, one of my oh, flags in the sand. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, good. <laughs> when we see when we see some of those smaller, um, very uh, hyper local events um, gaining a little more traction, you know, I take that as a positive sign. We haven't actually seen a return to the same level of. Uh, resources coming out about individual breaches as we have seen in prior periods. So, you know, I think we're going to be dealing with this effect for a little while, but um, I do think things are starting to return to normal. And even that one, that state source that I uh, spoke to a little bit earlier that was like 60 days behind, they've even gone through an update cycle in the last uh, couple of weeks. So, so I think information is making its way out. It's just a little... Uh, it's just, it's just struggling a little bit, like so many of us are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All that. Uh, any closing remarks? Because I think that takes us to the end of today's session. I am good. Thank you. How about with you? Excellent. Well, then, I, I will say this. Hey, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. It's been really good. I think it's been a really interesting session. Uh, we would love to show you around Cyber Risk Analytics or any of our other products, so please check out our website, riskbasedsecurity.com, and the product, which is cyberriskanalytics.com. Do get in touch. If you have an itch, we can help you scratch. But for now, we will see you again in a little over a week for our mid-year vulnerability quick view, so watch out for that one. Until then, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>